Merhaba hocam. Merhaba. Okay. So I am welcoming everyone to our church uh, book talk of the semester by Vieran Kursar on uh, the recently edited, uh, co-edited book of his. Uh, Evliya Çelebi in the Borderlands, New Insights and Novel Approaches to the Seyahat Name, Western Balkans and Iran, Iran Sections. Um, so Vieran Kursar had received his PhD from the University of Zagreb and he is an Associate Professor of History and Hungarian, Turkish and Judaic Studies at the University of Zagreb. He has published on various topics of Ottoman ethno-confessional, legal and social history, mainly related to Bosnia, the Balkans and Istanbul. He is the author of Creation Levantines in Ottoman Istanbul, 2021, and the co-editor with Nenad Moacenin and Cornelia Yurin Starcevic of Evriya Çelebi in the Borderlands. This book we will be hearing about today closes the focuses on two borderlands of the Ottoman Empire, the Western Balkans bordering the territories of the Republic of Venice and the Habsburg monarchy in the West, and Safavid ruled Iran and Azerbaijan in the East. Such a focus provides an opportunity for a comparison between the Eastern and Western borderlands of the Ottoman Empire concerning topics relating to economic and social history, urbanization, ethnic and confessional relations, as well as the history of reception. The book also deals with the Evliya Çelebi's travelogues editions and translations in the countries of the Western Balkans and how different editions or how working with different editions makes a difference in the reception stories and historiography. Now I will uh, thank again to Vieran Kursar for accepting our invitation and joining us today and leave the floor to him to talk uh, about the book, the motivations behind his its its compilation, the conclusions they have attained with this project, and the experiences in general in uh, being the editor for such a project. So thank you and welcome again. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, uh, it is an honor to speak in front of the Boazici uh, University audience and uh, I would like especially to thank uh, Dr. Huner Chora for inviting me uh, here. Uh, I will try to, uh, pre uh, to present the book I co-edited with Professor Nenad Moachanin, uh, who unfortunately was unable to uh, come today, and Dr. Cornelia Yurin Starcevic, who said she might uh, come because she has uh, classes, she's busy, but uh, I, I'm not sure, in fact, did she do you see her among the people here, but maybe she will come later, I don't know. As well as some other authors, I hope uh, they will come and they will help me <laughs> with this uh, presentation. Uh, I saw Slobodan uh, Ilic, Dr. Slobodan Ilic, who is here, Professor Slobodan Ilic. I'm glad that he came. And as I said, uh, I'm expecting some others uh, to join, uh, to join uh, uh, as well. Uh, of course, they will significantly uh, contribute to this session with their uh, insights and their experience. Uh, now I'll, I'll put a share screen. Uh, I don't have, okay. Okay, I guess you, you see it. Uh, uh, I will talk about the book Evliya Celebi in the Borderlands. Uh, actually, uh, the majority of the articles in this volume were uh, presented at the workshop, uh, the latest edition of Evliya Celebi Seahat Name, the Accounts of New Insights that was held at the Faculty of uh, Humanities and Social Sciences, University of Zagreb uh, in June 2000. And uh, 16th, it was organized by the uh, editors of this volume. Uh, the workshop one was one of the activities of the project Evlia Celebi and Croats, uh, New Perspectives, headed by Professor Nenad Moachanin and funded by Croatian 
Science Foundation between years uh, 2014 and 17. Uh, and it was based at the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences of uh, University of Zagreb. Uh, other members of the project team were Dr. Marta Andrić, uh, Professor Ekrem Čaušević, Dr. Cornelia Jurin Starčević, and me. I uh, uh, hope Dr. Marta Andrić will join as well, as well as Professor Ekrem Čaušević. Uh, who was the founder of the Turkish Studies uh, Department in, uh, in Zagreb. Uh, uh, the focus of the workshop was the, on the autograph of Seahad Name, the Book of Travels of the 17th century world traveler and boon companion to mankind, Evlia Celebi, and its recent Jakob, uh, 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 EKE uh, edition, Yapakrebi uh, Kredi uh, edition. Uh, since it has appeared, uh, uh, important and sometimes huge differences were uh, established between, uh, between uh, this uh, new edition and the uh, earlier uh, abridged or uh, incomplete uh, editions. Uh, Uh, the several authors in the present uh, volume uh, directly addressed this problem, that is this uh, uh, differences between the earlier editions, uh, the Igdam edition, the late 19th century edition, which was also uh, 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 the text that uh, Yugoslav edition uh, was based on, uh, done with, uh, by a great uh, historian and translator, Hazim Shabanovic in 1957. Uh, uh, some of the authors address these problems, for instance, Alex, uh, Professor Alexander Fotic on the example of Serbia, Cornelia Jurin Starčević and Marta Andrić on Croatia, Slobodan Nilić on Bosnia, and uh, Nenad Marcin in his micro study of the Croatian uh, town of Osijek. Uh, uh, in addition to local team and specialists for Western Balkans region, Alexander Fotic of University of Belgrade and Slobodan Nilić. Uh, from Near East University in Kozia, the workshop was attended uh, by renowned evliologists uh, such as uh, Jean-Louis Baquet-Gramont uh, of uh, Centre National de Recherche Scientifique uh, from Paris, uh, Robert Dankov uh, of University of Chicago, uh, Hakan Karateke of University of Chicago, who I hope uh, uh, will uh, come and join us if he manages. Uh, Nuran uh, Tejan of Bilkent University and uh, late Semih Te Tejan uh, also from uh, Bilkent University. Unfortunately, Semih Tejan, one of the greatest Turkish experts on Evlia Celebi, passed away in 2017 and uh, uh, was not able to uh, finish his text for the present volume. Uh, uh, anyhow, uh, we are happy that uh, Two established scholars uh, joined later and contributed to the volume uh, with their articles, uh, namely Fariba Zarine Baf of University of California, Riverside, who uh, uh, will join us, I hope, if she's not already here, and uh, Mohamed Reza Basi Naderpur from uh, Gualicina uh, University, Hamadan, uh, who co authored the article in the present volume with uh, Jean Louis Baquet Gramon. Uh, their contributions were, were uh, on uh, the Persian borderland. Uh, the book, uh, as said, is focused on the two uh, borderlands of the Ottoman Empire, the Western Balkans, that is Bosnia and Croatia with Serbia, bordering the territories of the Republic of Venice and Habsburg monarchy uh, in the Ottoman West, and the Safavid ruled Iran and Azerbaijan in the Ottoman East. Uh, this provided the opportunity uh, for comparison between uh, Eastern and Western Ottoman borderland concerning uh, topics related to uh, economic and social history, urbanization, cultural history, and ethnic and confessional relations. Uh, these are, uh, this is the program of the workshop and uh, this is the last day of the workshop. Uh, uh, Sofra, I think uh, Evlia Celebi would uh, approve approve of. Uh, here is the table of contents. You can see the name of the articles uh, from, the, uh, from the book. Uh, I said uh, uh, these uh, Persian, Persian uh, uh, articles on Persian history, Persian borderland, 
are very valuable uh, because I think they uh, really might offer uh, insight in the in the other side in the other borderland and uh, provide uh, uh, opportunity for a comparison. Uh, in my own article on uh, drinking cultures in the 17th century, according to Evelia Celebi, uh, I uh, I tried uh, to do such a comparison. Uh, I focused, of course, on the Western Balkans, which is my field of expertise, namely on uh, Croatia, Bosnia, and uh, partly Albania, uh, which were notorious for uh, heavy drinking military class and, uh, and elites, in addition to common folk, of course. Uh, surprisingly, uh, Evlia reports that uh, in, in one of his stories that uh, uh, a Muslim warrior, Ghazi, whom he encountered in Ribnitz and Dalmatia following the battle against the infidel, uh, invited him uh, to drink wine with his comrades, uh, uh, quote, for the love of religion and love of Ali Murtaza, end quote. Uh, when Evlia replied, uh, quote, hey brothers, wine is forbidden, haram. I won't drink, but I will eat the bread. Uh, they said, uh, he who says the wine is forbidden blunders. Uh, the wine is a property acquired by Gaza in the Holy War. Uh, those who say that the property acquired by the Holy War uh, is forbidden are infidels as these captives, as the people they captured in, in the fight. Uh, this wine is paid by our blood. It is the property of the, law, uh, of the lawful and, and the pure Holy War." End quote. Uh, hearing this threat, Evlia left his host in hurry without eating. Uh, he mentioned also that they had very uh, big kebabs, so he really was uh, eager to join them. But after uh, uh, these threats, uh, he decided it's, it's uh, wiser to leave. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, the Dalmatian Gazis used the almost the same uh, phrase to invite Evlia to wine drinking as the Safavid governor of Tabriz, uh, Kel Pali Khan. Uh, whom Evlia visited on a diplomatic mission. Uh, Ali Khan was insistent and offered uh, Evlia various pleasures in addition to wine. Quote, if you love uh, red Murtaza Ali and the 12 Imams, come, my believer, cough a cup of wine from the hand of one of these boys. Uh, that heads may grow uh, warm and the breast grow soft, that we may get a bit of pleasure and a moment of gratification. Uh, uh, in this banquet hall of evanescence. Uh, Ali Khan was threatening uh, Evlia uh, as the Dalmatian Ghazi warriors, but dismissed him as a fanatic. Uh, that invoked uh, Ali Murtaza in question. Uh, the invoked uh, Ali Murtaza in question was the cousin and the son-in-law of uh, Prophet Muhammad, the fourth righteous caliph of the Sunni Islam and the first imam of the Shia branch of Islam. Uh, while understandable uh, in the case of Iran, uh, such invocation is surprising in the context of the Western Balkans and Bosnia and Dalmatia in particular. Uh, since the presence of uh, disreput disreputable uh, Kuzelbash heretics and sheets is not documented here at all, as, as far as I know. Uh, the reason for such veneration of, uh, by the locals, however, might be Ali as a model warrior, especially respected uh, among uh, Ottoman military class. Uh, the invitation to drink for the love of Ali Murtaza, the chosen one, seems to be used as a literary device, however. Uh, Evlia was obviously making an effort to establish a link between followers, uh, followers of Shia Islam uh, and alcohol, and in such a way further criticized uh, the Kuzelbash heretics on morality grounds. Uh, in the case of the Western borderlands, Evlia was implying that devotion to Ali was popular among borderland warrior class and Gazis, both in Albania and Dalmatia and Croatia. Uh, this must have been uh, so due to Ali's aura as a great warrior, while it had little to do with inclination to Shiism as such. Uh, perhaps the imputation of praising Ali and this, uh, and this re disreputable Shia or Kizilbash Islam uh, served as a trope directed against disobedience to the norms of Islam and non-conformity in the Balkan borderlands in general by its superficially Islamized population. Also, it is possible, uh, especially in the case of, uh, of uh, Albania, that Evlia was referring 
uh, to the followers of the Bektashis, which have some uh, connection with Shia Islam, though not with uh, Kizilbash. Uh, anyhow, he was stunned with, with their relation towards uh, alcohol, and uh, but somehow he always connected it with, with their uh, uh, affiliation to Ali. And he mentioned for Albania that they even, uh, in Girocaster and some other places, that they, that, that they even speak Persian, which is really uh, very, very strange. I don't, uh, and I asked some colleagues also, about uh, speaking of Persian uh, among common folk. It's not some uh, uh, scholars, scientists, but common folk uh, that they speak Persian, which does not seem uh, really, uh, really uh, possible as far as we know. Probably this was one of the, the Evlia's uh, device uh, to make uh, readers uh, astonished and, uh, and confused and to, to make some other points. Uh, but now I'll uh, turn, turn to, uh, to the articles from the volume. Uh, in the first article, Ebna Shelby's Balkan Travels and his attitude towards the other, uh, Nuran Tejan analyzes Evli as positive and negative attitudes towards non-Muslims in the Balkans with reference to his perception of the infidel. Uh, she establishes that the term uh, for infidel or uh, kafir or kefere or kufar uh, appears uh, 8,000 times in uh, Seahat Name, uh, almost always with negative connotation, while Evliya typical in the context of the Holy War in which he was uh, participating, uh, 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 these infidels were uh, portrayed as uh, subhumans exposed to uh, uh, to killings, uh, to plunder, enslaved, uh, and so on. Uh, however, in a different context, because he was not uh, only a participant in war, but also sometimes he was on a diplomatic mission uh, uh, to the other side, outside the Ottoman borders, uh, uh, he sometimes has a different approach uh, as a diplomat and, and a, a somewhat a pioneer tourist, he appreciated infidels architecture, painting and sculpture, as in the cases of Dubrovnik and Split, uh, uh, Jamal Kafadar uh, 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 has an article on his, uh, on Evlia's visit to Dubrovnik and Split and his enthusiasm for the Western art he saw there. Uh, or Vienna, which is also a well-known uh, case. He's, uh, uh, he was really astonished with what he saw in Vienna so much that he said that it is uh, better that it, will, uh, that it is not uh, conquered by the Ottomans because Ottomans would ruin uh, all those buildings, uh, cathedral and, and other achievements of the, of the Western infidel uh, science and arts that he appreciated so much. So it would be better not to uh, come under the Ottomans. Even himself uh, said uh, uh, so. Uh, and interestingly enough, uh, while on diplomatic mission, uh, unlike in other cases, uh, Evlia, uh, uh, Evlia uh, sees his uh, Christian counterparts as equal as and uh, worth of respect, which was the case, for instance, uh, of uh, Ban of Croatia, uh, Nikola Zrinski, uh, one of the uh, one of the greatest uh, noblemen in Croatia, one of the uh, uh, mightiest person, uh, the old name, uh, the old uh, uh, family uh, of Zrinski, the great uh, Ottoman enemies, uh, uh, were actually uh, very much respected by Evlia, especially after this personal encounter in Chakovets in his own uh, town, where he was uh, hosted and treated uh, uh, very well too. Uh, Robert Dankov in his uh, article, Puzzling Passage in Evlia, Celebi's description of Croatia, explores Evlia's description of town of Dernish and focuses on his BR bizarre reaction towards uh, the burial scene and peculiar mourning rituals of fallen soldiers by the locals. Uh, as Dankov says, uh, perhaps the scene of mourn mourners uh, praying in a strange dialect was a macabre spectacle for Evlia and his associates, causing them 
involuntarily to, to laugh uh, out loud. Uh, this text maybe particularly shows that Evlia's elitism, uh, elitist perception of local population may have been uh, peculiarly critical, sometimes disregarding confessional affiliation and the nation and the issue of uh, otherness, because they were these were Muslims, not uh, not not uh, infidel, but anyhow, uh, the way they prayed was uh, very funny, uh, very strange to uh, to Evlia, so uh, he ridicules it. Although he says that they speak uh, a very good Arabic also. Uh, and Turkish. Uh, in the article, uh, Ottoman Osijek, as seen by Evlia Celebi, Nena de Marcin uses data uh, from the Evlia's travelogue as a source for urban history of the town of Osijek in Slavonia. Uh, in combination with archival sources, uh, the picture of urban development, development of the town was substantially uh, revisited at, and amended. And uh, in general, I think that such, of, uh, such combination of uh, narrative sources such as Evlia and archival sources uh, and their comparison uh, when possible, of course, when you find such an opportunity is the best way to get uh, through and uh, to get uh, further details and a more firm context of the Evlia Celebi's travelogue on the one hand, and on the other hand, to get uh, richer and more colorful information uh, uh, which can enrich and complement somewhat dry uh, archival material on the other hand. Uh, again, in my own study, uh, 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 some of Evlia's uh, observations were, were actually confirmed in uh, both Ottoman and non-Ottoman uh, archival sources, as well as in the South Slavic folk songs, such as those about uh, King Marko, Kraljevic Marko, and Muslim folk songs collected by Kosta Hörman and uh, Alia, Alia Nametak. So uh, really it is possible sometimes uh, uh, to, to find uh, uh, additional material which really uh, then confirms uh, uh, stories from Evlia, which sometimes really uh, might seem as uh, exaggerating, uh, or something else, but uh, often uh, they are, or sometimes they can be uh, confirmed in the archival sources, or or by other uh, or by or by other narrative sources. Uh, Fariba Zarinebaf, in her article Evlia Celebi in Azerbaijan: The Economic and Religious Landscape of a Borderland Region in the 17th Century, analyzes Evlia's report on this contested and porous borderland and his notes on rural and urban life, ethnic and confessional relation, and uh, so on. I don't know whether Fariba is uh, here, so uh, maybe she's not here. Maybe if she comes later, then she, she, uh, she can uh, herself explain uh, how she was using Evlia uh, as, as, a, as a source. Uh, and now the second part of the book uh, was actually uh, more about uh, structure and the technical aspects of the Seahat Name and the translations and the histori uh, historiographical use of uh, Evlia Celebi in the Western Balkans uh, historiographies. Uh, in the article, how did the volume arrangement of Evlia Celebi's travel account evolve, uh, Hakan Karateke examines the earlier conceptual stages of the travelogue and the development of the idea of the book structure, which is uh, very important. We don't think about it, we take it for granted, but it's actually very interesting uh, to know how the, the, the book, the, the travelogue in the end came into, into being in the present form. Uh, and the last block of the article serves uh, the reception uses of uh, Evlia Celebi's travelogue in uh, historiographies of the country of the Western Balkans, especially uh, Serbia, Bosnia, uh, and Croatia. Uh, Alexander uh, Topic examined the top, this topic in his article Receptions of Evlia Celebi's Ahad Name in Serbian historiography. Cornelia Jurin Starcevic examines the example of Croatia in the article The Autograph of Evlia Celebi Seahat Name as a new source for Croatian history, preliminary survey of some selected examples. They are both uh, also historians who, in their work, uh, usually use archival sources 
uh, as, as the prime material. So uh, their insight into, uh, into the region uh, is uh, uh, very valuable in comparison with the information FLHLB uh, provides. Uh, the comparison of traditionally used uh, translation of Hazim Shabanovich, one of the greatest uh, Yugoslav Ottomanist historian uh, uh, from the second half of the 20th century when Yugoslav uh, Ottoman historiography was one of the best in the world, uh, based his uh, still canonical translation on the Igdam, that is uh, Ahmed, Ahmed Jevdet's uh, translation from the late 19th century, uh, which was, as you know, uh, heavily censured, uh, and uh, sometimes uh, there was also self-censorship. Uh, so uh, that actually, uh, that Igdam edition is is not, uh, uh, it's, is itself uh, full of uh, mistakes or omissions. So Shabanovic used, used that. Uh, and uh, then later uh, historians in, uh, Yugos in former Yugoslavia actually used that as a source. Now the appearance of the Yak uh, uh, Yapakredi edition, which is uh, uh, actually very close to the autograph, uh, uh, gives opportunity uh, to gather new information. And actually, for instance, in the uh, example of uh, Croatia, uh, almost 30% more is present in the, in the, in the autograph that is in the, uh, and also in the Yapu Kredi, which is a huge, huge difference. So we have some stories which were not included in the, in the uh, uh, until then known uh, translation or, uh, or the uh, Igdam copy. Uh, and this is the topic of Sloboda Nilic uh, on misreadings, deliberate uh, living out, secondhand translation, and lazy editors, the forthcoming edition of Evla Celebi's book of travel through uh, Bosnia and Dalmatia, and some critical remarks on previous editions of the related chapters, and Mart Andrich's uh, The Prototype and Tentative Variants of the Croatian Translations of Seahad Name. Uh, Ilic, especially uh, Professor Sloboda Nilic is here, so he can comment on that himself. Uh, he reconstructs the translation and the editing process of the Seahat Name of both Igdam and Shabanovich, as well as a, a modern Turkish scholars edition published by uh, Yapakredi. Uh, and he concluded that actually, which was interesting, that the uh, uh, Yapakredi edition is not uh, the definite one as claimed, and that is, as the previous one, inadequate in uh, many ways. Uh, and he uh, categorized these omissions and mistakes as uh, misreadings, uh, mistranslations, and uh, deliberate omittings. I think these deliberate omittings are uh, uh, non-existent or, or very, very few in the Yapakredi modern edition. But in the previous ones, of course, they were uh, very, uh, they were not so rare. Misreadings. Uh, uh, are understandable. Unfortunately, the Yapakredi editors did not uh, consult uh, the experts for the Balkans. So sometimes uh, some names or place names uh, or uh, words from Slavic or other Balkan languages, which are uh, understandable to the, people, to the Balkan scholars, were uh, not read by uh, Turkish, uh, Turkish uh, experts. Uh, or sometimes they just uh, leave dots or, or completely misread things. This is uh, this was that was I think that was unnecessary that might have been uh, solved. Uh, even mistranslations are uh, sometimes present. Uh, Professor Illich uh, uh, collected uh, uh, quite quite a lot of quite a lot of uh, them. Uh, I myself also found found one uh, small example, uh, uh, but I will not now. Uh, uh, of course, everyone can uh, misread or mistranslate uh, a word or, or, or two. Um, and Marta Andrich, this was the last uh, article. Uh, 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 herself, a linguist and a translator, uh, discussed the value of the authoritative Shabanovich translation despite its limitation as a stepping stone for future translations. And I think. Uh, especially vis-a-vis uh, -vis style and language, uh, she still thinks that uh, that uh, Shabanovic translation into Bosnian, Croatian or Serbian language as you as you uh, as you as you wish 
can be used as a kind of a model uh, how 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 the new translation modern translation uh, uh, should uh, should look like uh, and uh, uh, to, to to finish uh, as it is well known uh, the late uh, 19th century translation uh, edition uh, igdam was uh, heavily censored by the uh, abdul hamid censor which uh, eventually, uh, well, eventually it was classified as uh, harmful, the whole book and, uh, and banned. Uh, and uh, it seems that sometimes the self-censorship uh, appeared as well, which is not surprising in that climate of uh, fear and insecurity and uh, paranoia, which was uh, 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 illustrative of the uh, Abdul Hamid's uh, epoch. Uh, in the case of the canonical translation into uh, Bosnian, Croatian, or Serbian language by famous Ottomanist Hazim Shabanovic. Uh, the omissions that he uh, makes or mistakes actually stem from that uh, Igdam edition, which he used. This was the only one at the moment. However, he himself also omitted some passages that he uh, 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 thought might be harmful for then uh, Yugoslav uh, socialist uh, uh, order. Uh, why he did so? Uh, he himself uh, uh, was a former su suspect uh, and alleged fascist collaborator who was denied the right, uh, the right to write under his own name after the Second World War until the 1950s. So uh, one of his greatest article uh, about the archival sources from the uh, Ottoman archival sources from the uh, Bosnian uh, Franciscan monasteries was published without his name. Uh, so he was, even after that, it seemed that he was uh, uh, a bit afraid and uh, uh, unwilling to further provoke the communist regime. So some of the stories uh, nowadays, when we read them, they don't seem so subversive, but he thought maybe that uh, 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 put forward, I don't know, some ethnic or, or uh, ethnic uh, clashes which were present in the in Evlia Celebi or something religious might provoke maybe uh, uh, communist censors. Uh, anyhow, despite uh, uh, mentioned limitations, Shabanov's translation is still uh, regarded as canonical and even modern authors, authors recognize its value, uh, not only linguistically and uh, style-wise, but historically as well, since uh, Shabanovich was a well-established uh, historian himself and uh, experien experienced archival researcher, uh, equipped with, uh, and he equipped his uh, translation with uh, a rich uh, historiograph historiographic commentary and sometimes corrected the misreadings of the Dam edition or its typos because uh, he would, I don't know, read the number of uh, houses in some town and he would say, no, this is impossible because he, he he uh, he read earlier the death there, so he he thought ah, this must be a mistake. Then he would correct some of uh, some of numbers like this and uh, so on. And his commentaries are very very valuable because of his insight as a historian. Um, for instance, uh, one of the the, the censored parts uh, by uh, by uh, Igedam was that story about uh, the Gazi warriors in uh, Ribnica uh, who offered uh, Evlia, uh, Evlia uh, wine. And when he said he don't want to drink it, then he said, uh, and then they said that that was the insult to the holy war of, of them. So this is one example of, uh, of uh, censorship of Igdam, which was then repeated by, by uh, Shabanovich. Uh, and uh, now I will, uh, I think this is what I had to say. Now I would invite other contributors if they are here. Uh, Slobodan Ilic was here. I don't know uh, how about others. I can uh, stop sharing my screen and, uh, and uh, Slobodan, would you like to uh, comment on your experience and your work uh, on, the, on the manuscript of Evlia Celebi. If I can unmute myself, now I think that you can hear me. 
Uh, well, great pleasure to to go back to the time when we spent a wonderful three or four days in in uh, Zagreb, uh, very uh, cooperating on a very important and, and pleasant uh, project. Well, uh, the title of my uh, paper is rather long, uh, probably a bit disturbingly long uh, to explain it. You know, just first to, to explain the end, lazy editors, it, that's me, uh, because it is, uh, I just, I'm just finishing the, the project uh, in Brill's edition, partial edition of the uh, earliest travel through the, his known world, uh, covering the area of uh, Dalmatian rocky hinterland and uh, Bosnia. Uh, he came to Bosnia one more time later, but this was not covered in this, this book. So I, after let's say 50 or 20 years for different reasons delayed, I am now finishing this. And you, uh, during uh, work on, on, on um, the manuscript, three manuscripts, actually the first, uh, one is this uh, Badat Kershke, and the, I consulted also Beshira and Perte Pasha. Uh, and also naturally uh, I consulted also Igdam edition and this canonical edition of our Hazim Shabanovich. You know what we had and what is uh, regarded as a holy book uh, in, in, uh, of, of uh, of Evlia's uh, eviology in, in um, uh, Balkans, in Western Balkans, is actually what Turks uh, would say, Chorbanan, uh, Chorbasan, Chorbas, or Chorbanan, so you know, something like this. So it is uh, uh, three times revisited, and everybody cut a piece from this. One misunderstood, other understood, but preferred not to understand, and so forth. Uh, actually, our uh, Hazim Shabanovich was a decent old gentleman, and he actually would never put in his uh, mouth, uh, even if it is this word, uh, these words are words of, of Evlia, uh, many, many details. And you know that Evlia was actually very spicy in his, in his language. So he preferred to uh, 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 avoid the proper meaning. Sometimes, actually, probably he himself didn't understand when he talks about beautiful ladies of split and uh, showing their their secret, uh, ex actually exposing to customers their secret stuff covered somewhere there. He was obviously talking about prostitutes or ladies who were just showing much more than it was uh, usual in his part of the world. But uh, uh, every, but Shabano is translated this as just uh, uh, they have uh, very beautiful women, women there. So things like this, not to talk about uh, some um, uh, uh, dialogues from Leek, I think, when um, you know Evlia Celebi was by profession uh, musahib, meaning it is a combination of advisor. Uh, touristic guide and uh, Nadim, somebody who is drinking and eating together with some prominent personalities, in this case, uh, Melek Ahmed Pasha. And so he should prepare his, his master, his, his patron, for uh, uh, all pleasant and unpleasant experience uh, he, uh, waiting for him in this probably unfriendly part of the world. So uh, very probably he could uh, hear some curses, some offending words and some obscenities. And this is exactly uh, what Evlia Celebi likes to put inside. So we can find uh, particular parts of female body in three languages, 
theoretically in three languages. Now it is probably six if you call Serbian, Croatian, uh, Bosnian, <laughs> one language, and Montenegrino probably is the fourth. Yeah, yeah. It should so, be politically correct as much as possible, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, last, last month I, I read the biography of the colleague from I don't know which university in Turkey, claiming to speak next to Arabic, which I, I guess that he's Arabic, he's Alhamdulillah, and that's all. And uh, English, probably it is not more than how do you do. And, but he also claimed, probably he was from our part of the world, claiming that he speaks Serbian, Croatian, uh, Bosnian, and I think that he mentioned also Montenegrino language. Uh, for all of you who are, I'm sure, familiar in Balkan affairs, by like our profession and the and uh, living rather near to us, you know that these, these are the same languages or even not dialectical differences are. Okja people in the north speak one dialect, being Serbs or Croats, people in the south speak another dialect, but it is naturally politically correct to call your language by the name of your nation. The same way how in German um, uh, newspapers, they always say that uh, uh, Donald Trump was talking Americanish, not English. That friend, that uh, Austrian president was talking Österreichish. Uh, just it is it is a correct way of expressing language of the people, but it is the same language naturally, as you know. So, talking about the the mistakes and the traps in all this work of, uh, of uh, translating of Evlia in modern Turkish language and others. First, as uh, Vieran mentioned, uh, mistakes in uh, uh, misreadings of anthroponyms, uh, just too many of them, and also name of the places. Uh, it is rather, uh, uh, it could be avoided very easy, easily if just, uh, invited some local people from this area to participate and to help help to them because some mistakes are rather comic even in this last uh yap uh, credit edition uh there are also not only mistakes in reading our language which is not so big shame but also mistakes in reading uh arabic or farsi which is shame if uh if somebody reads in, in some modern editions, I think including Yapo Kredi, uh, the Tarikh of uh, mosque in, in Bosnia, when uh, he said, okay, you are historians of literature, so I know that you know this. Uh, Allah inspired us, his, it's uh, Tarikh, it's chronogram, and the guy translated this, uh, read it as Allahumma, probably more familiar to him, but actually uh, very probably familiar also to Evlia, but he didn't talk this. Uh, what Vieran mentioned uh, is that very interesting that Shabanovich corrected Jevdet, uh, in particular in numbers, for example, when talk about Haas of the governor, he said, okay, it said that this, but I found in other sources and he actually wrote what his original manuscript says. So Evlia was right, Shabanis was right, but uh, in between Igdam edition was, was wrong. Uh, Shabanis himself edited some, his own mistakes uh, reading some, some names. Uh, for shortening, we can uh, uh, count uh, four different types of deliberate omittings in, in um, Igdam and uh, Shabanovich. First, uh, parts indirectly suggesting to sexual slavery and more specifically, pederasty. Uh, when uh, Evlia talks about Sarajevo, he says that uh, they have uh, beautiful ladies uh, 
so sheriffly and namuslu that even nobody from there uh, except their mahram, the, their family could see their faces. But on the other side, there are just too many beautiful young boys who are uh, too ready to help Ghazi uh, uh, to, to uh, solve his, his problems. And also coming into direction saying that, uh, coming in uh, rather directly uh, in uh, details, explaining how Bosnian boys are blonde and not too hairy. And, and so they're showing they are younger if, if, if they are not so young and so on and so forth. Naturally things like this were not good enough uh, for, for Jebdet, but also not for Shabanovic's taste and probably for Abdul Hamid and communist, communist censors uh, also. The second, the second part is what we had also mentioned, uh, parts depicting loose morality uh, or disrespect of religious uh, observances uh, on the part of Ottoman soldiers. Uh, there are even, even, even uh, more uh, uh, blasphemic uh, parts of this dialogue when um, uh, Evliya said, Ebu Hanifa said this or that or I don't know, they said he could do this. So this is parts which obviously could not be printed in original, in, in the translation. And also what uh, Vieran mentioned, uh, kind of uh, self-censor, censorship uh, on the part of Hazim Shabanovic uh, is that, you know, uh, former Yugoslavia was always unhappy marriage between Serbs and Croats, you know, and this balance, they always needed the balance, good guys and bad guys to be on the same level, not to show anyone. And he as, as Muslim was also rather cautious to not to not to put Muslims in the past as oppressors or whatever. So in, 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 uh, uh, in uh, Igdam, there was mentioned that uh, servants, servant girls in Muslim houses were mostly uh, Croats, Croatians. And naturally, uh, uh, Shabanovic found it inappropriate, but it was strange uh, saying that, that uh, not Croats, the majority were actually Hungarians. When I consulted the original text, Evlia really talked about Hungarians, not about Croatians, probably uh, Jevdet, misread this, or probably he also told it would be better to put uh, Croatians uh, instead of Hungarians, who knows? And uh, naturally the last, the last category, we could say general obscenities. I am not, not less polite than, than Shabanovic and Evlia and, and the Jevdet, so I will not uh, cite it for you, but I advise you to read the, the, the original text and you will find rather uh, hilarious uh, parts, parts of this, of, uh, of the text. Uh, uh, so to finish with the uh, Yapa Kredi edition, uh, claiming to be definitive one, it is not definitive in any case. Uh, just to mention to you how they read localities, even after Shabanovic. Probably they even even they didn't even consult it Shabanovic. Uh, you know, I mentioned this in a conference in Istanbul last year. Then people just think uh, that all of us Serbs, Croats, Albanians, others. The, there we in different way pronounce uh, names of the places. And example, they said Novo Brdo, uh, calling it Brdo. In Albanian it's Novo Brdo, only in Turkish it is Nova Berta because of you, not because of the, so this is the, uh, I just made a list, just uh, Meslovene, Maslovene, Janak, Janok, Primoria, Primoria. It is just, just the list, the list is very, very, very long. And uh, basically that was it. There is one interesting uh, uh, piece of poetry, 
except from uh, Poto Shahidi, uh, versed uh, dictionary of Bosnian language to Turkish, uh, which was just too many times people try to translate this correctly. I am uh, impolite enough to claim that only my version is, is uh, uh, correct. Uh, so thank you. I didn't want to, to uh, uh, steal the show. So I probably, I apologize for talking uh, too long. Uh, thank you very much for, for listening. Thank you, Slobodan. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't know, do we have uh, some of other contributors from the original, uh, from the book here, IPEC, did you see? Not that I see, but if I am missing anyone, so please do join us. And if not, I think we can start with uh, getting questions. And if there are no questions, or if you are still forming your questions, I can uh, start by asking one, actually. Uh, it was when I received, uh, when I got the book and uh, when I have been reading it, actually, the first article also you mentioned, Nuran Tezjan's article makes a very, I think, subtle and important point about Evliya Chelebi's reception and his own perception, saying that there were three Evliya Çelebi is actually in the text. Uh, one is the his Muslim identity, and one is his uh, Ottoman gov government official identity, and one his traveler identity. So uh, how, and I was very curious if all the papers were looking actually, not on one Evliya Çelebi, but on these three different identities of Evliya Çelebi. How would it look and how would it change our understanding of the whole corpus? So that would be my questions. Do you see different identities of FDI uh, in the, Both in your work and also in the whole project that you have been involved in. Yeah, yeah, I think, I think you are right. I think you can see uh, different identities, uh, different attitudes towards the same thing. Uh, for instance, I was working on uh, alcohol, uh, uh, use and misuses of alcohol uh, in my own article. And uh, very often he says, I never tried the drop of, uh, of alcohol or anything like this. And even my ancestors uh, were such. So, but uh, he knows so much about uh, different types of drink. Uh, some were uh, haram, others were not. Uh, and so on, but he knows in such a detail that I, I was wondering how it is possible. For instance, this, his uh, description of uh, drinks that were served in uh, Mehanes in uh, taverns in Galata are amazing. I mean, it's really uh, such a connoisseurship that uh, really, it, 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 is, it is really amazing. And the other thing is not okay. He's, uh, he, he knew very much about uh, all kinds of different uh, types of drinks. But uh, also, he, although he did not consume anything as, as much as uh, if we believe him, uh, he, uh, he was very often in the company of uh, drinkers from the Sultan himself. About him, he said that he was drinking wine, though he, we don't know whether uh, he did refuse the Sultan's offer of a glass of wine like he did refuse the, uh, the governor of uh, of Tabriz or the Gazis in Dalmatia. Uh, but he was very, very often in the company of, uh, of uh, people drinking and uh, it seems that it did not uh, bother him. For him, it was enough to say, okay, I will, I, I'm not drinking, but others can uh, do uh, as, they, as they will. So I think on one hand, uh, uh, as a governor of uh, Tabriz said, he, he was a fanatic, uh, if, we, if we wish. He was teasing him, but on the other hand, he was very, uh, very, very tolerant and let's say liberal in, in some of his views. Also uh, concerning the non-Muslims, I don't think it was uh, predominantly the problem of uh, them being of uh, different uh, 
uh, different religion, lower religion. Uh, I think it was uh, mostly his elitist uh, Istanbul uh, center-based worldview that uh, made him sometimes despise or ridiculize uh, people from the provinces. Uh, that is that is my opinion uh, on on that. I see Ariba joined now. Maybe uh, you can uh, you can invite her to to share her experience on the on on uh, on her research. Yes, I was actually uh, just uh, take the word to give the floor to Professor Ariba Zarinabov if she would be. Uh, kind enough to say a few words about her contribution and her general experience mm -hmm. with working on ADHDB. Uh, well, first of all, uh, good evening, good morning here in Chicago. Hi, Vijoran. I really enjoyed working with, with him and the editors on, on this volume, and I think it looks excellent. Uh, well, you know, I have used Evdia Chelebi for, uh, for my two books on Galata and Istanbul, and I think he's indispensable. I'm someone um, who works in the archives, you know, uh, most of the time. I don't really, you know, like just reading narrative sources, but Evdia Chelebi is amazing. He really fills the gaps for us. Without reading him, we would have no clues about social life, right, in the Ottoman Empire. Um, I'm hoping to uh, use him for my next book on Tabriz and Azerbaijan. I'm glad that Vijaran brought it up and asked me to write uh, my uh, my chapter because it really made me kind of you know read him and then I have a lot of archival sources and compare to see you know where the gaps are with with the sources. What is really fascinating with um, for me for uh, with Evdia as Vijaran pointed out is his lack of bias. You know I think travel really changed him and um, you know to to far corners of the empire, getting out of Istanbul and I would highly recommend for you to read his dream narrative when he starts out volume one, you know, he has a dream of, you know, all the imams and the prophet, you know, sending him on his mission to travel. And then his father encourages him to travel and set to the road. And I think as he travels, he really changes as a man. He's no longer the Istanbul elite, you know? So, and you can kind of see his observations and his ambiguity towards the Safavids. You know, on the one hand, he describes um, you know, as, um, <clears throat> as heretical, but then he says, wait a minute, you know, uh, these people are good Muslims, right? Um, I don't think what they say about them is correct. So he goes out to correct all the, you know, misconceptions about the Safavids, about that borderland. Um, and it was really amazing. He's always, you know, making a commentary about Saf Ottoman policies in the borderlands. And he says they were wrong. They destroyed this region. Look at what has happened to this town, what Murad, the forces, the army did to this town. You know, why he also talks about all the buildings that the Ottomans, you know, constructed. So I think, you know, um, one has to really see him as someone who, as he travels, uh, he changes. Um, and, you um, he, he becomes a very open-minded man and, and it's a man in, you know, as he transforms. Um, that's the way I see Evlia. And I think that, you know, he was also a great scholar. He used a lot of other sources. Um, when he got back to Istanbul, he did his research. So I compare his notes with other sources on this region. So I think it's not just based on his observations alone, but he's reading Ottoman sources. He interviews the locals. He knows the history of all these regions he's traveling to. So he's truly impressive. He's a scholar, a traveler, an envoy, a diplomat, you know, a tax collector, what have you, all of these things at the same time. So that's all I wanted to kind of insert here. Uh, thank you very much, Farida, for joining us. Yes, and I have the feeling that Zeynep Boksayusu's question may be from that frontier. So I will leave the floor to you after thanking you for joining us and sharing your experience with us. Zeynep. Oh, okay. Um, yes, I, um, one second, I'm lowering my hand. Thank you very much, uh, all of you, uh, for, for this very interesting um presentation i'm really looking forward to reading the book as soon as uh, i can um i have a, a question for dr kursart um there was an article that i read uh, uh, recently on uh, the 
well, by an anthropologist, Nicola Elial, who will actually, we will host on Zoom uh, this year uh, at the Nafi Baba Center. He has an article on the, um, um, on the role of drinking in Bektashi culture, in present day uh, Bektashi culture in South, uh, South Anatolia. Um, and he talks about um, this idea, well, he talks about, uh, you know, drinking, uh, uh, you know, with men and women in the same uh, mejlis. And, um, and he talks about very specific um, rituals related to drinking and how it's perceived as a, a ritualistic act and, and what that entails. Um, do, do you find it, 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 it does Evia Chelevi's portrayal um, have any aspects that would uh, that sh that talks about drinking as a ritual and, and and of course how he views that or how how much access he had to that uh, in this uh, example that I mentioned uh, the one from Dalmatia with Gazis and the other one with uh, the, with the governor of uh, Tabriz. Uh, the, if if you count that as a as a ritual like uh, invoking uh, Ali Murtaza, then then maybe drink for the lo love of the Ali Murtaza and the twelve imams uh, uh, in Tabriz, then uh, then might be. But uh, otherwise otherwise he does not go in uh, such uh, such detail. He he uh, he did, describes the drinking at the court uh, by Sultan Murad. Uh, but not not as a, not as a ritual. Uh, I, I I must admit I did I did not uh, 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 read the the, the whole uh, twelve uh, ten volumes uh, in detail. So uh, maybe there are some other parts that I that I missed. But for the region that I studied, Western Balkans and let's say more than the Balkans in general and uh, Istanbul, and and those parts of on Persia, uh, I did not find that I can remember such such uh, such an example like ritualistic drinking. Thank you. I think he more used this drinking examples as kind of uh, ridicule and uh, some of these uh, garaip vajaip uh, ridiculous stories that he enjoys uh, uh, with entertaining uh, the, his audience. Also, maybe as a ritual, it might have be something that he would not have access to in the first place, which could, well, other than maybe that it wasn't, that, that, that practice didn't exist at the time, but also maybe that not something, that, that could be something very secretive. I don't know. <laughs> but thank yeah. you very much. I wanted to um, encourage you to read my book on Galata, if you haven't, because, you know, there he, uh, of course, you know, visits Galata. He, he talks about all the taverns, 200 of them along the harbor in Galata. He talks about, you know, Muslims and Christians drinking. He, he talks about the, the wine tax. You know, he's actually the first who mentions it. And then I went to the archives and found the registers. Otherwise we would assume that the Ottomans banned drinking completely. From him, you learn that not only they didn't, right? There were taverns everywhere, not just in Galata in Muslim neighborhoods um, and that they taxed it. So then, you know, you go to the archives and find these amazing registers on, you know, on wine. Uh, Humur, you know, Resmin, he talks about the Muslims actually operating or collecting, you know, being in charge of the tax form. So it really shows you, you know, he's not really trying to portray the Ottoman Empire as this kind of Muslim Sunni empire. To the contrary, I think he really shows the diversity of, of, of this empire in terms of all these various ethnic religious groups, he doesn't condemn. I mean, he has his biases, you know, and I think for a man coming from that society, you know, those are normal, but he's not trying to give us a kind of, you know, um, whitewashed version of, of Istanbul or, 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 or of any place he visits, you know, saying, oh, these are pious Muslims. No, he says, you know, there are Muslims who go bankrupt because of drinking in Galata. Look at them lying on the ground. So, um, so I think you, you guys really need to read him. Uh, if you can read him in, in Ottoman or Turkish, Robert Dankov has translated so many versions of Galat uh, Evliya's you know, uh, travels into English. Uh, you need to discover him for yourself. There is no way we can tell you what he says, what he covers, right? And it's, it's, 
an overwhelming project, but start with volume one on Istanbul, you know, areas where you're familiar with, and then just, you know, go through Istanbul reading Evliya, right? Use them as a travelogue. Uh, that's how you can discover him. That's my recommendation. Uh, yes, I would like uh, for this ritual drinking, uh, I don't know whether that counts. Uh, when he uh, describes Sarah uh, people and the habits of the people, what they uh, drink and what they eat, then he mentions uh, different types of drinks. And for them, for some of them, he says that uh, they uh, uh, give uh, special uh, incitement, kaif verir, he says. Uh, and among them, he mentions a uh, 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 different type of uh, liquors. And we don't know for these liquors how, uh, what was the percentage of alcohol in them. But obviously, since they give, uh, improve, move in a uh, mood in a way, uh, they might have had something. Uh, uh, interestingly, he mentions uh, one of such drinks uh, called Ramazanie, uh, which, which was drank during Ramazan. Uh, and he says the, the best one was to be found at imams in, uh, in Sarajevo. Uh, he said, which was made of grapes like Museles, uh, and he says it knocks men off feet. Uh, so uh, obviously this kind of drink uh, was kind of a gray zone. Uh, he says it was not forbidden, it's not haram, it's not like wine, but uh, just uh, improves mood. But if it knocks you uh, off your feet, then uh, uh, it is something. Now, uh, I mean, it's not directly uh, linked to ritual, but again, this connection with imams and uh, Ramazan uh, is, is very, very interesting. And uh, Evli, although uh, he's uh, really sometimes very, pur uh, very Puritan, uh, he does not uh, stop himself uh, uh, from narrating such kind of stories, which are really uh, uh, controversial from the, our perspective, modern day perspective. I'd agree and second that uh, he has such an approach, especially regarding conversion stories. But instead of going into details, I will leave the floor to Harim Kara for his question. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your talk and thank you also for your insights. Uh, this is a, it's a fascinating book. So I, someone who is focusing on modern Turkish literature is a little bit, uh, my question might be a little bit uh, naive, but I was wondering when you were talking about uh, Evliya Çelebi's uh, identity, you know, uh, complexity of his identity and how it was dynamic in it change. Uh, I, I'd like to ask two questions. One is about uh, what kind of uh, audience uh, was he targeting? You know, who was, who was he writing for? Uh, the other question about, uh, this is, I don't know, that's why I'm asking, you know, uh, Evliya Çelebi's, you know, perception uh, in the societies that he, he visited at, say, at uh, exactly the same time, I mean, when he was traveling and, you know, interacting with different people, are there any sources like in the Balkans about him uh, from the 17th or, you know, 18th centuries? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, questions. Uh, first, the audience. Uh, I guess the audience of uh, Galata were uh, the Ottoman elites, uh, those who could uh, understand uh, his, uh, his stories, uh, his narrative, uh, his uh, subtle, uh, subtle jokes and his humor. Uh, so I guess uh, people, of, uh, hi people of higher uh, higher establishment, uh, uh, educated, of course, uh, who could uh, probably from Istanbul. Uh, yeah, that is my opinion. I don't know if you have some other uh, uh, opinions on this. Yes, I would like to hear. Uh, uh, sorry, what was the, the other question? I forgot, I it's about, you know, he the way that he was perceived at the time when he was traveling in different societies. 
like when you went to Croatia or, you know, when you went to Iran or, you know, Soviet Empire, you know, uh, are there any sources from the time of the book actually and how they perceive, you know, Evliya Chalabi himself? Because mm -hmm. he has so many opinions about everybody. I was wondering their opinion of Evliya Chalabi actually. Uh, uh, we know that he left uh, left some traces of himself. Uh, we have uh, some of his uh, graffitis inscriptions preserved, so there these are traces of him. And I'm not sure, but I think recently something was found in Dubrovnik, something about him. But I don't know. I don't know details. I, I will have to to check check on that. Uh, Otherwise, uh, as far as I know, he was not in, in Croatia for the region I'm dealing with. Uh, he was not, he was not uh, mentioned uh, by, uh, by name. Uh, probably he was not such a big uh, uh, guest as he, as he uh, often tends to present himself. But uh, I don't know, I'm also Ottoman uh, historian, so uh, maybe that would be a question for someone dealing with uh, with the European, uh, that is uh, Austrian or Venetian sources, or something that has to be done in collaboration, because these are not the archives that I know uh, so well as I know the the Ottoman Ottoman side. Well, um, as long as far as the Safavids are concerned, um, he went there twice, and I think you know um, in Safavid Iran from his interactions with the locals. It seems that they, they looked at him as an Ottoman representative. He's an envoy. Um, and you know that, you know, at that time, the, the Ottoman Empire didn't have an embassy um, in, in uh, Iran or elsewhere. You know, embassies became really, you know, um, an Ottoman institution in the 19th century. So they sent out uh, envoys. So, um, so Evliya played that role. I think in Croatia, he was also collecting taxes. So he went there to settle a dispute between Kurdish tribes who had crossed into Iran and stolen 40,000 sheep, right? And, you know, border disputes that were part of, you know, the Afnames between the two empires. So it, it seemed to me that people knew him. So he had arrived and they had announced that you cannot curse the three caliphs because the Ottoman envoy is here. And as he's going through different Iranian, you know, towns, he says, oh, they say they're Sunnis, you know, Shafi'is, but I know that they're Kuzubash. They're hiding their identities. So of course, you know, they respect him. The governor, you know, is in charge of showing him around. What's really fascinating for me in my next book on Azerbaijan, he goes all over the place. He goes to the Caucasus and he talks about all these powerful local guys, you know, bays, you know, who have these mansions and palaces that you can't find anything like that, you know, in Anatolia. So his perspective, again, you know, I think as someone representing the central government is fascinating, but at the same time too, you know, he's, he's interviewing the locals. I think he was also a spy. He collected information, uh, crucial information for the government back, you know, in Istanbul. I think all the Ottoman envoys were spies. Uh, so what they prepared usually, you know, um, before a major war. And of course the Ottomans invaded Iran in 1720, way after Evliya's visit, but, but he's also collecting information. So he's, you know, an, a government official, the Safavids know that really well. So they try to impress him, right? And they give him the information that they want to give him. But at the same time, he's taking notes, he's observing, right? He's preparing a do, report. Do, do, we, do we know those notes or do we have those notes? Well, it's in the travelogue. No, before, <laughs> uh, in addition to travel log. I think how I mean, uh, uh, his article is about how, you know, he, uh, he put the volume together, you know, he was taking notes while he's traveling, obviously, because you can't have a memory to know everything. Um, and uh, he could have, you know, also collected written documents. He had, you know, access to Ottoman archival documents in Istanbul. So he assembled everything to put together all the numbers. I think he also looked at, uh, geographical works from Iran, you know, from the medieval period, because he copied and pasted. So he plagiarized, right? I have documented that for Tabriz, for Azerbaijan, where he's copying a 14th century, you know, uh, geographical work, where it's his, his own information. Sometimes he has blank, right? He's going to fill in the gap when he gets back to Istanbul, right? So, so I think one has to really unpack 
of the utility by looking at other stuff, archival documents, local sources, you know, he's gathering information, you know, and it's not just like for his travelogue, I think he's also gathering information from Murat the fourth. He commissions him, he goes, go out there, tell me what's out there in Istanbul, you know, come back and report to me, right? So, so he's, you know, he's doing it for, for a reason. Thank you so much. And on the note on Evliya taking notes, as far as I know, and uh, Hakan Karatek's article discusses this, uh, we don't have the notes, but he ha has hypotheses regarding the cross-references within the volume about how he might have compiled the whole book. And in addition to his travelogue, I think one thing that is confirmed to be his, his is a map of the Nile which has been also published by Nuran Tezjan and Robert Tankov. And as I have the word and there doesn't seem any other question, if time allows, I will have one more question to the speakers, especially uh, after Professor Uric's uh, presentation and paper. I have been thinking about Evliya Terebi and historiography because he has been always a part of the Ottoman historiography. And actually many problems that oh. Professor Irit shows is this Ottoman centricism or Ottoman studies centricism in looking at Evliya Terebi's travelogue. So I will just speculatively ask what would be different if we were to work on Evliya Terebi not from within the Ottoman studies, or how would that be possible? What would change? So I know there won't be a clear answer to this, but I think it is important to think about it. So I would love to hear your opinions about it. Uh, I, I'm not sure whether I uh, understood uh, your question. Uh, how how the people outside the Ottoman studies can use Evliya or no? I mean, what I mean is, we always think of Evliya Çelebi as an Ottoman source, which he is, but he has so much about foreign lands and uh, what if we would take the focus from him being an Ottoman and studying him from the, within the Ottoman Empire, but take him simply as a traveler visiting other lands? Would there be any changes in? in the perspective we look at the source it is not i mean my question is more about us than being on every actually i think and how we look at the whole source no, that, is, uh, that is an interesting question and i don't know the answer uh, on it i know it's very popular uh, not just among the ottomans in the balkans but among other people because they want to to uh, hear his opinion and his kind of uh, taken as kind of a neutral source, which is also interesting because uh, 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 non-Ottomanists are usually very critical about the, the news from the Ottoman side, but uh, they accept uh, 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 Evlia as, as uh, different. I think his, um, uh, his witness, his uh, skill, in writing and entertaining uh, 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 the audience is uh, something that is uh, relevant even, even to us uh, today. Uh, people were very critical about uh, Evlia in many respects, uh, uh, accusing him of uh, lying, uh, uh, giving false information and so on. But I think uh, if we uh, take this as, uh, as his method of, a method of entertaining, other people that uh, we can come closer to to the uh, to the to the truth. Uh, whether we can think of him as a non-Ottoman traveler, uh, I don't know. Maybe, but yeah, I don't I don't know exactly how to answer answer that question. I think uh, what Ipak is trying to <clears throat> um, to uh, raise. Is his, his importance for the history of non-Ottoman lands? So, um, and as I said, you know, I think he's really indispensable for uh, the Eastern borderland, right? For for um, I don't know if he traveled to Isfahan. I, I doubt it. But um, there is a contribution by Bakir Gramon on Hamadan, um, 
the caucuses is amazing. Now I'm reading his, his you know, coverage of the caucuses of Georgia, you know, Northern Azerbaijan. You know, we don't call the North Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan historically refers to the region south of the Aras River, Iranian Azerbaijan. But it is amazing. I mean, I'm just unpacking him and I'm hoping to, you know, cover that region because if I didn't read Evliya, I wouldn't have been interested, right, in Karabakh and Shirwan. He gives us the, the social map, you know, where the Muslims live, the Armenians, the Kurds. I think without Evliya, we wouldn't really be able to understand the richness of this region. He brings the peripheries of the Ottoman Empire into conversation. Otherwise, a typical Ottomanist would not be interested in reading about, I don't know, Kars, in reading about Karabakh, Genja, you know, all those regions that we consider really the, the edges of the empire. You know, he, he gives color to these regions. You know, we, we realize how important those regions are. And I don't think <clears throat> Ottoman archives or narrative uh, historical accounts from Istanbul would pay any attention to those regions. As far as, you know, the Ottomans were concerned, they just went in there to plunder and collect taxes, right? So that's what they left us. We don't know anything, but Evliya opens a new world for us. Right, and I think we need to take him seriously. I don't think I read him for entertainment at all. So I disagree with people, you know, who think that Evdia is out there to entertain people. I don't think when he gets to that region, he's entertaining, right? There's not a bit of entertainment actually. Yeah. So we need to take him seriously. I mean, that's, that's, you know, my own, you know, sort of after having read him, you know, for Istanbul, now for Azerbaijan, for the Caucasus, I think he's an amazing source. He is, you know, you have to compare him to any serious, you know, travel material from the Western world. I'm talking about before Orientalism. You know, it's it's a travel tradition, but it's more than that. Yeah, then uh, on that I can add that, yes, if you compare uh, Evlia to uh, Western travelers, then I think uh, he's much more reliable. Uh, he offers much more information about the same uh, region, you cannot even compare the, the, the information, the quality information and the amount of, of information, the nature of information then you get from the Western travelers with that of Evlia Celebi. He was really thorough. Uh, he was very, very observant. He was observant even for minor teams, uh, obscure teams, which is very interesting. Uh, his interpretations are very, very interesting, uh, very modern, I might even uh, say. Uh, uh, he was very inclusive, wanting, wanted to include uh, everybody, although he has this uh, elitist uh, uh, approach of uh, Ottoman gentlemen from Istanbul, from the center of the empire, and he looks down on the people from the provinces. Uh, he's uh, ready uh, to acknowledge some value to them as, as well. Uh, first of all, he includes them in his, in his travel, which is... Uh, something that other travelers don't do with uh, with uh, common folk. Uh, when he ridicules these uh, Ottoman warriors, Gazis from Dalmatia, for their behavior, uh, later on he he admits that they are uh, very good uh, fighters, very good knights, and and uh, he uh, he appreciates some of their values of those people from the from the very border. And he says, if there was not for them this probably wouldn't stay in, in the Ottoman hands. So he's very, very well aware of their value to the, to the empire. Although he's of course critical of some of, of their ways, uh, but he also says that these are their ways, these are their customs, so I should not judge them. And I think this is uh, something which is uh, very, very rare in, uh, in that type in uh, travel literature. In general, not just in uh, in his time, but later on, uh, as well, and sometimes even in our times, uh, Evliya is maybe more uh, more neutral or more inclusive, uh, more tolerant in his view, and more observant than many many modern uh, travelers. Yeah, I wanted to also add, you know, uh, on the question of his identity, uh, someone mentioned that he was a Puritan. He was a Sufi. So, you know, when he <clears throat> arrives to Azerbaijan, the first thing he does, which is really fascinating, he visits two places. One is the shrine of Sheikh Safi, the Safavid enemy, right? He goes and he pays his respect 
you would think that as an Ottoman Sunni, right, he would not even approach that place. Um, and the Ottomans and the Safavids are still at war. And then the second place he, he goes to is the tomb of Ghazan Khan in Tabriz. Um, and he pays you know, his respect to him as well. Um, he gives you the religious topography of the city, you know, when he goes, you know, around and he says, this is where these people are buried. And he's very respectful in tone. So he's not treating this region at all, you know, uh, as the sheer enemy. If anything, he's trying to say, look, we're wrong. You know, there's, there's, you know, um, they're just like us. And, and then, you know, the Ottoman also religion includes all these figures. As I said, in his dream narrative, Ali plays a central role. So I think again, you know, uh, he also talks about himself, which is rare for Ottoman authors. They never reveal, right, their own identity, their own religious, through his dream narrative, right? We kind of get an insight into the mind of Evliya and maybe people like him and about, you know, his ambiguous position between, you know, Sunni Islam and this is the Qadizad the era during which he's writing. Right. And between, you know, these other, you know, Islamic um, identities. So I don't think we can pinpoint and say that, you know, he's a Sunni Muslim because I don't think he was. I think he was Sufi. He was very open um, and typical of maybe Ottoman elite at this time. And he was probably critical of the Qadazad elite. And I think he was because, you know, he was very close to Kisam Sultan. And, um, and I think his coverage of women is also fascinating of Ottoman elite women. So you kind of, you know, if you read, you know, um, more of, of the Istanbul volume, you discover that he doesn't represent the Qadizad elite point of view at all, which, which was dominant among the elites uh, during this era. Uh, yeah, yeah I, I agree with you. I don't think he was a Puritan uh, himself, although probably this was the climate of the age because of this pressure uh, done by uh, the Qadizad elites. Uh, so sometimes maybe he uh, felt that he should appear maybe more Puritan than he actually actually was. And yes, he was against the Qadiz Adelis, definitely as, as a Sufi, as a dervish. Uh, this was not the approach that he, that he uh, approved. And we can, uh, we can read about, about his uh, uh, tolerant uh, approach towards everybody uh, on almost every page in the, uh, the travelogue. So there are too many things probably to discuss still, but we are uh, ending. To, we are coming towards the end of our time. I'd ask the uh, remaining audience who were with us until the very end if there are any other questions or comments or concerns. Professor Edith? Uh, I will try to not to answer, but probably just to extend uh, your question regarding the, could we, regarding the position of Evlia, could we look at Evlia's work outside of the framework of Ottoman historiography from outside? And this is the key question for all of us involved in Elvia researches because Evlia is outside of the Ottoman historiography. He is not part of the mainstream of Ottoman historiography. He is very personal. You know how Ottomans, how Ottomans used to write historical books. They were not writing uh, for a younger generation to learn how their predecessors lived. They wrote to confirm, uh, to make, to uh, add a legitimacy to actual ruler. Uh, you are from the field of literature, so you know very well George Orwell's 1984. And you know the guy who, the main, the main uh, uh, personality in the novel, uh, his uh, uh, working place was Ministry of Truth. So his job was to adjust uh, news from the past uh, to, to reshape them, to give them uh, something what is connected and with legitimized actual uh, uh, government. So if we were with, uh, with uh, 
uh, Eurasia in the war and now we are friends, we should change anything negative or positive about our friends or, or foes. Uh, this is how Ottoman historians were writing. There were no copyrights. They just uh, wrote everything what was written until now. Just rewrite this, add in something, combining things. And that's why they rarely put their own names inside. But uh, Evlia is also connected with this uh, for whom Evlia was writing the book. Uh, I don't think that the book we now have is final. We see too many lacunas, we see too many. Uh, the, this uh, city has, I don't know how many mosques and he put lacuna because he doesn't know, he wanted to learn it later. Pro, uh, and uh, seeing uh, the way how he was writing. Uh, I can imagine him writing his notes, sitting on, um, on, ho on the horse. You know the way how Ottomans were writing in the long term, not, not uh, like this, but one leg was uh, above other, so rather uh, uh, useful for writing. And he was just writing during this, his travels, just as a kind of, uh, just making notes for the final version never being finished. And uh, to whom he was writing? To his uh, uh, patron, to legitimate uh, his power, and to, for himself, as any traveler writing his, just uh, in order to, to remember beautiful experiences uh, they had uh, during the, the, the travel. And then third was for potential public, of, obviously uh, belonging to the highest, highest uh, uh, circles of uh, Istanbul elite. Uh, that's what I wanted to, to, to say. And the, it's great that Evlia after all those times still uh, uh, succeeds together intellectual elite from uh, Croatia, from Turkey, from, from uh, America and so on, uh, thinking uh, and discussing about him after all those, all those centuries. Thank you for your question because your question is actually answer of part of us what we are doing. Thank you. And I want to thank again to Vieran and Professor Zarnevav and Professor Ilic for being here, for joining us uh, today for the last book talk of the semester. And we have one more talks left for the semester in our book history series that will be on 27th. Uh, and we will be looking forward to see you there if you would have the time to join us. Thank you so much again for being here. And I hope to see you again in our events. Thank you very much for the invitation. And I thank the audience for the patience and for the questions. <laughs>